Jesus, the Crown King, Sunday, March 24th, Palm Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday where the people, believing that God's kingdom was finally arriving, filled the streets shouting, Hosanna, flinging palm fronds in front of this man, Jesus, riding not on a large steed with sword in hand, as was the custom of the Roman conquerors, but on a young colt not yet grown in Mark's gospel. Hardly what they expected. Mark 14. The day before, while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table of the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some complained at the extravagance, but it was customary to anoint a new king. So as they would find out later that day, it was also used to anoint the dead as they were buried. Then later that evening, they gathered to break bread together and Jesus said these enigmatic words. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink, I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Again, it seemed hopeful for the new kingdom they thought that he had just proclaimed with certainty for the next day. But there was an ironic undertone of betrayal and death as yet to be revealed. It would certainly not be what they imagined. It had been a long three years, both with his being anointed with precious oil on the day before and these words from the nameless woman, it seemed very logical and reasonable for the disciples crowded intimately around the table with him to believe that on that next day they would parade into the heart of Jerusalem to lead a revolution that would end the cruel reign of the Roman Empire and that they could then claim their ascendance with him to rule the newly freed nation. Then the new day dawned as the sleepy disciples assembled themselves for the procession into town but it did not go quite as they expected. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this, say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh-oh! The plot thickens. No one conquered a town on the back of a small horse. It looks as if Jesus' feet are almost touching the ground. He has no armor, no sword. His followers have fronds of palms in their hands, not swords. What was this? Were they going to a children's party? This is what he should have been riding, complete with helmeted foot soldiers, shields, and spears. Well, it wasn't exactly what they expected, but they were so used to the surprises Jesus constantly threw them into their hitherto orderly, former lives. But they went along with it, maybe even bowing and waving to the adoring crowd as they grew closer to the city center. center. Then Jesus led them to the Garden of Gethsemane and things started to deteriorate rapidly. As the night wore on, the disciples fell into a deadly stupor. Being rudely awoken by the return of Judas, the kiss of betrayal, and his arrest by the Roman centurions. Rapidly convicted, Jesus was stripped of his humble garments with a crown not of gold and jewels on his head, but a crown of thorns and wrapped by the soldiers in a purple cloak, a symbol of royalty, and this next procession led to his painful and terrific death on a cross. As a final irony, the soldiers who were gambling at the foot of the cross to see who would win Jesus' cloak posted this sign. 
Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judaorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, calling him the King of the Jews, the final insult. To the soldiers casting dice at his face, to the onlooking on crowd, Jesus certainly didn't look like any kind they'd ever imagined. He was probably naked, the loincloth adding on paintings later to protect his image and private parts. His crown was made of thorns where it had pierced his flesh, leaving his face covered with blood. If anyone had dared to think that this dying man was going to be their king and overthrow the Roman Empire, they were sorely mistaken. Jerusalem had had a long series of conquerors go back to the Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, and now Romans. None of them just folded up their tents and left peacefully. They fought to the death, the skeletons of their soldiers still lying on the desert sands. So how could Jesus be anything other than just a thorn in the Roman Empire's side, at best a small annoyance or entertainment for the crowds as they watched him process to his death? That day, both the crowd and the governors of the Roman Empire had proof positive of the end of these fantastical stories of Jesus. They just had to look up to the cross to confirm that with their own eyes. But there's another story which begs the question. Exactly what kind of empire was Jesus going to institute if not a successful armed rebellion and some sort of a political military overthrow to keep the policy? Uh, the populace in line. This kingdom was hidden just under the surface. The first clue is when Jesus told his disciples to find him a very young horse, or in some versions a small ass, for him to ride into Jerusalem. He was treated as a clown or a fool, both on his way to the cross and by the sign above his head. What kind of kingdom was he trying to bring anyway, if it was what the people expected? He was a colossal failure, ending with his broken body being left on the cross on a seemingly God-forsaken hill outside the sacred city's limits. I purposely call this title Jesus the Clown King because if we look through the eyes of the clown and the clown's history, we can better imagine and hopefully accept a newer kingdom far more powerful than the ones that were based on power and the use of might. The crowds must have heard of the gladiatorial games in the Colosseum where two armed combatants would battle each other to the death. Quite possibly some of the soldiers from the Roman legion stationed there might have witnessed them if they had been posted earlier in Rome. It sounds a bit bloodthirsty with the crowd cheering on the combatants, and yet between the contestants there were pre genarii. I'm not showing off, I never heard of this word until this week. Now I have to figure out how to use it in a sentence. Mock gladiators whose duty was to entertain the rest of the crowd between the fights. They were totally mock gladiators using blunt weapons, lassos, and ropes. Some were even deformed, such as dwarves or those with only one arm. They also did animal acts, and it does not need to be said that they never fought the actual gladiators. Their weapons were humor and props, not real swords. In the Middle Ages, we see the emergence of the court jesters. Their purpose was also to entertain the king, and yet they had another function. If they were careful, they could also poke fun at him in a veiled way and get away with it, a feat no one else would ever dare to do with the pain of imprisonment or even death. We carry this today in our current usage of the word. If we say, it was just a jest, it's a way to state something truthful in a way that if confronted, we can deny or say it's just in fun. It reminds me of the story of The Emperor Has No Clothes from Hans Christian Andersen. A vain emperor is tricked by two swindlers who promise to make him a set of clothes that are invisible to anyone who is unfit to hold their office or is stupid. In reality, the swindlers are just pretending to weave the clothes and the emperor ends up walking naked in a parade, unwilling to admit that he cannot see his own clothes. The phrase has since become an idiom used to describe a situation where someone is pretending to be something they are not, or when something is revealed to be a fraud. It's a way of pointing out that someone is not as powerful or impressive as they claim to be, or of exposing a lie or a deception. 
It's only a small child that dares to speak the truth. This picture above was taken from the performance of a screenplay by David Scarpa called Napoleon, where he is depicted as wearing no clothes. Most of the pictures I found to illustrate the story were cartoon characters and the others not very revealing, shall we say. Yet here we can see not only the emperor's pomposity, but the reactions of his attendants. The man in front looking a bit horrified and the woman behind him trying to hold back a laugh as they have a good close look at his genitals. Then comes the rodeo clown. Not only did the clown entertain the crowd during events, they were trained to intercede with their own bodies if a cow head was tossed from the back of an enraged bull. They would rush toward the bull, ready to gore the toss rider, and would distract it until the cowpoke was able to get over the fencing. I suppose now it might be easy to use a stun gun or another cow head with a horse to intervene. But it is significant to me that even the littlest of us can do, like the little boy in the story above who said, the emperor has no clothes. Here is a picture I found of a rodeo clown. I cannot imagine myself being there with just a raging bull heading my way. I would just slip my entire body into the barrel, crouch down and start praying. Yet it worked. The distraction gave other cowpokes times to rush into the arena and help the fallen cowboy back to the safety of the fence. The same tactic came up in the student rights of 1969 and 1970. They were not only protesting an unjust war, the draft, the corporate greed, and financing of the weapons of mass weaponry that kept the conflict going for years. I was a graduate student then, and all my male classmates at UCSB lived in dread of the draft. There were many protests there, and it's a sister university in Berkeley. Sometimes, instead of holding hands, sitting down, throwing rocks or other objects, some protesters dressed as clouds, using humor to engage the armed troops. It's fun to see this picture with the puzzled and stunned looks of these two officers, as one of them is simply embraced by two clowns, he was simply overpowered with no ready answer in his arsenal to respond to them. There are no bully clubs descending on these clowns' heads, no handcuffs in sight, just the utter confusion of these two law officers not knowing how to handle two smiling clowns embracing one of them. I must admit that I like clowns best. I actually took a couple of clowning classes, but I've yet to go to a protest dressed as one. I usually wear my clerical collar and stole. The clown outfit would be more fun, but I lost my round red nose and oversized shoes. As you reflect today at the possession of palms, so, yes, palms, <laughs> the entire church is celebrating. Think for a moment what kind of kingdom you are hoping for. What kind of kingdom you are willing to join in possession? The one fueled by hair and control or the one fueled by overwhelming love and commitment to be part of a crowd willing to put your own lives on the line every day to help bring it about. So make this decision seriously and deliberately. I am not clowning around. The Roman Empire thought that they'd won that day with Jesus' dead body hanging from the cross for everyone to see. Perhaps this day, but the battle was not yet over. And Easter and hope were just around the corner, waiting for the sun to rise on an empty tomb. The joke's on them. Hosanna in the highest. <laughs>